I would like to introduce this series by asking the question, how many of you believe that the share market is perfectly rational? Whilst contemplating your response, I want to emphasise that the aim of this series is to challenge what is too often taken for granted and perhaps alter your perceptions. My perception is that the share market is perfectly rational. It is people who use it that are irrational and superimpose their hopes and fears onto the share market. The share market has no emotions and cannot be euphoric or disappointed. Only humans display these emotions. The share market, on the other hand, mechanically goes about its two primary tasks in an efficient and timely manner. We tend to lose sight of what these functions are. First, to provide companies with a means of efficiently raising capital. And secondly, subsequently, providing you and I with a mechanism for exchanging for value the ownership of these productive businesses. Sadly, it has become all too convenient to blame the stock market, the messenger, for displaying the appalling habits of others. Some of you may be familiar with this slide. It is important to me. This slide displays the written word. And if you are human, you will not read what is written, but immediately shuffle things in your mind to make the words fit your preconceived idea of what it means. The principle I want to establish is the following. As pointed out in this article, with only two pieces of information in each word in the right spot, you are able to make sense of this. A similar situation applies with a spoken word. Presenting thousands of times, I have become aware that with a few key words in a sentence, many people are able to draw their own conclusions from what is said rather than observing the meaning that is trying to be conveyed. That could be completely different. I want you to keep this in mind throughout this series and perhaps allow me to offer you a different slant on much of that we take for granted in the investing world. Perception is reality is an accepted truism. The contradiction is that for each of us, our individual perceptions are our own realities. This is why different perceptions enable two people to observe the same glass and have two different realities. That is, is it half full or half empty? This is where divorces and wars begin. Same situation, merely a different perception. It is therefore very important in the sessions that follow that I provide some definitions for some of the words I will be using to avoid watchers of this series overlaying their own realities. I want the message, or my perceptions, to be absolutely clear. The first word I would like to define is invest, a word that is used and abused by many to legitimise activity that has nothing to do with investing. Note the definitions of the word invest before you. The first two are the most important. Apply or use money, especially for profit, and put money for profit into stocks, etc. From these broad definitions, I could therefore assume that my purchase of shares and their subsequent sale, six or 12 months later, for a profit, constituted an investment. However, I would suggest that I did not invest, as I did not hold them long enough to enjoy the profits that the business will distribute to its shareholders year after year. To clarify this point, let's look at another word definition. To speculate. To deal in a commodity or asset in the hope of profiting from fluctuating prices. If one considers these definitions, I think it will become apparent that much discussion and commentary about investing is, in fact, nothing more than speculation.
using the word investing will never legitimize the activity. So during this series, I would therefore like to adopt a slightly modified definition from these very broad dictionary definitions. Investing is a long-term process with a repeat profit performance, whilst speculation is a one-off transaction that creates either a gain or a loss. Whether we invest in our own business or in other people's businesses, it is clear that it is normally for the longer term and for repeat profits. The hard fact of life for many of us is that we will find little reinforcement for the sensible long-term process of investing in a world of sound bites, breaking news and ultimately endless and useless commentary. To highlight this point, let's consider the following headline from June 2006. Investors bail as markets mood darkens. At this time, the share market was again going through one of its repetitious periods of down rather than up. This headline appeared in the Australian Financial Review. On the same day, this second headline appeared in another publication. But I would like you to observe the start of the second paragraph. Investors rushed for the sell buttons for the second trading day. I think from these reports, we can assume that investors were skittish and taking appropriate action, bailing out and hitting the sell buttons. I would suggest that this has nothing to do with investing, but the media and commentators generally would never reduce the relevance of their commentary by referring to any activity they are reporting as speculation. However, let's persevere. Two days later, on the 16th of June, having bailed out and pushed sell buttons, you may be surprised at what investors were doing next. Yes, you guessed it. As reported in the weekend edition, two days later they were piling back in. My question is this, does anyone believe that this is the behaviour of investors? One day bailing out and the next day piling in? With clearly speculative behaviour labelled as investing, it has become increasingly difficult for observers to distinguish between what is valuable and what is totally useless information. As a speculator, all this may be of interest. As an investor, it is nothing more than an indication of the manic mood swings of speculators as reported by an equally manic media. In this section, I want to try and impress upon you the importance of behavioural finance. That is, what we actually do with our money, despite all the economic theory. If we are the rational beings that economic theory assumes, then we would all be doing the same thing, which clearly we are not. When 50 million Telstra shares change hands in a single day, it requires both buyers and sellers. Who made the right decision? If investment property is a guaranteed investment, why does anyone sell it? Put another way, it is what goes on inside your head that will determine the outcomes you enjoy during your life, not what economists predict. Let's begin with some data and then explore some possible interpretations. This chart shows the three primary stock market indices, industrials, resources and the all ordinaries. It is important to note that this chart shows only the price indices alone. I have ignored the 30 years of dividends that these companies have paid. Thus, this chart gives you some idea of the relative pecking order of these sectors. Resources at the bottom, industrials at the top, and the all ordinaries somewhere in there. One cannot fail to note the impact of the re recent resources boom. However, I would like to express now a perception of mine.
In my understanding of history, virtually all mining booms and the inevitable euphoria associated with any boom end with an inevitable bust. So whilst I acknowledge the current commentary about this time being different, I do not believe that this boom will necessarily be any different to all those in the past. More importantly, the reason resources are at the bottom of the scale and industrials are at the top is because throughout history, digging stuff out of the ground has not created serious wealth. The real wealth has come from manufacturing, technological and intellectual inputs. It is these things that have added the most value and advanced the human race. So whilst in price terms alone, the resources and all ordinaries index have returned about 10 times your money, the industrials have returned over 13 times your money. Let's now look at these same indices if we reinvest the 30 years of dividends. The resources index goes from 10 times to 25 times your money. This modest result is because, apart from a handful of notable exceptions, resource companies generally are rather poor dividend payers, if at all. In fact, I observe that most resource companies are bought and sold on the basis of benefiting from price fluctuations, not dividends. I remind viewers of what this activity is defined as. The All Ordinaries Index goes from approximately 10 times to 33 times your money. And the industrials goes from 13 to 56. Yes, 56 times your money. I observe from these two charts that the bulk of the return from industrials comes from the cash flow or income that they generate for investors, not from share price movements. Sadly, it is the price movements uppermost in people's minds, as they are reported ad nauseum every day, whilst dividends regrettably only see daylight twice a year. Despite their overriding importance, they get little coverage. I would now like to share some of my perceptions as a long-term investor. In this chart, we see the All Ordinaries Index valued once a month over 30 years. I think most would agree that despite the persistence of the gradient, it is the short-term ups and downs that make investing in shares such an emotional roller coaster. Now, changing people's perceptions requires that the neural pathways they have established are altered. And so, whilst observing exactly the same thing, we can arrive at a different conclusion. Perception is reality. To ensure the best possible take-up of these changes, I would like to become Prime Minister. Firstly, I will shut the Stock Exchange so that no one will be subjected to the daily barrage of useless information relating to share price changes. Secondly, at present, I think you will accept that there are only two days on which you actually know what your house is worth – the day you buy and the day you sell. This is not good enough. So I will replace this with an edict that requires all television stations to report house prices by running them across the top of your television screens ten times a night. By the way, I will be making up your house prices every night using a random number generator. Anything between zero to a hundred million. Now having shut the stock exchange, I have a herd of commentators who desperately need a job. As a result, they will now be interviewing you daily on your street corners to find out how you feel about the fact that house prices in your street collapsed by 20% today. I will also invite a clever investment bank from the US to create the most toxic residential property derivatives ever invented. You will now be able to day trade residential property. I suspect that only 12 months of this activity will see many people 
becoming uncomfortable with the volatility and risks associated with property and begin seeking the safety of the share market. I will not accept that simply because your house is illiquid that it is riskless, nor will I accept that just because I can buy and sell a share such as Commonwealth Bank a hundred times a day that it is risky. However, let's explore this concept a little further. As the stock market is the mechanism that provides the liquidity enabling us to exchange the ownership of companies for value in a regulated and orderly way, I acknowledge this and as Prime Minister will therefore allow the market to open on one day a year. On that day, we can all complete our share trades and then settle down until next year. If you will accept this compromise, then the chart will now look like this. Are you more comfortable now that the market doesn't go up and down so much? Clearly, volatility is a major issue for many people, as it is the short-term ups and downs of the market that are focused on and create the uncertainty. In the example above, all I have done is restrict the valuation of the market to the one open day a year to alleviate the uncertainty. This substantially reduces short-term volatility, but at a price. If I auctioned your house every day for three months, I think you will agree that your house price will be more volatile than Commonwealth Bank, for example. Would it be a comfort or irritation to you to come home and find that the price of your house that day, Melbourne Cup Day, had fallen by 50% as only two mostly disinterested people attended the auction? Volatility is a direct result of liquidity, that is, the ability to buy and sell shares hour by hour, but it does not represent risk. Conversely, the fact that your house is illiquid and therefore lacks price volatility doesn't make it riskless. In the mind game I have just played, I have taken away your liquidity. Hence, shares are no longer volatile. At the same time, I have given your house superficial liquidity. Hence, its price is now volatile. The choice is yours. No liquidity, no volatility. Liquidity and volatility. What's your perception? I am a relatively uncompromising investor and would like to share my perception of how the chart of the share market appears. As unusual as this appears, I will explain. I know how much I paid for my shares and I know what they are worth now as they were all publicly auctioned today. The only difference is that I choose to ignore all the noise in between those two dates, just as you do with your house. That's fair, isn't it? Which, as a long-term investor, would you prefer? And before you answer, remember, whether you choose this chart or the earlier one, you still end up at exactly the same point after 30 years. More importantly for me as an investor is the fact that the only change is the gradient of that line, infinitesimally on a daily basis. To demonstrate, let's look at it again, but only once a year. This is what the chart looked like in 2006. And again in 2007. 2008 and 2009. In a few months I will update the chart again for 2010 and no doubt stress over the outcome. Continuing my comments about perception, I would like you to consider again this chart. The 1987 crash is quite apparent. Now Reconsider the chart and tell me if you can point out the 87 crash. The 
Look carefully. Like everyone I ask, I know that you cannot point out the crash because there wasn't one. My perception is that the 87 crash actually didn't happen. Allow me to explain. Between October 1986 and October 1987, the index rose 100%. The market doubled in 12 months. It subsequently fell by 50%, which returned it to where it started. All that occurred was a period of irrational behaviour, which was followed by the inevitable, perfectly rational correction. I say rational because I simply do not believe that it is possible for the value of all Australian companies to double in a year. Note that I use the word value. Clearly, all that happened was the share prices doubled but the value remained roughly where it should have been. It brings to mind the quote, most people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. I can think of no clearer example than this. Sadly for the stock market, this pattern of behaviour is repeated again and again. Any cursory reading of history will underline the often irrational ups and downs of the market in the short term. It has become the barometer of irrational sentiment, reflecting fear, greed and uncertainty. As such, it has considerable appeal to the media, often hungry for useless information. As a consequence, I have often exhorted audiences to heed the words of that famous Australian philosopher, Chopper Reed, and to toughen up, Princess. Having looked at some of my politically incorrect perceptions of the share market, I now want to drill down to demonstrate where the real value lies. In this next slide, I'm going to offer you two potential sources of retirement income. One will be red and the other yellow. The data I will use represents three years of actual income from these two sources. The main rule of this particular engagement is that I want your decision to be reflex. By that I mean I don't want you to dwell on the information. Merely make the decision quickly based on what I am about to visually present. Now I believe if the majority are any example that your choice would most likely have been the red income stream, as it was clearly superior. I have given three years data as a reasonable representation of the time frame one might use for making this sort of decision. Current year, one year historic and one year prospective. As an observation, I would suggest that often decisions are made without any reference to time frames or basis in fact, but merely on perceptions of likely outcomes. To continue this experiment in perceptions, I would now like to offer you more information. But before I do so, I would like to draw a distinction. Information isn't knowledge, and knowledge isn't wisdom. I draw this distinction because of the prevalent assumption to the contrary, that is, that if one has a larger amount of information, then one is in a superior position. I believe that knowledge is required first to enable us to assimilate and use information productively, as without knowledge, most of the information at your fingertips will be largely useless chatter in your hands. I now invite you to choose again the income stream you would prefer. Clearly, extending the time frame gives a totally different result. Now what we have here are two income streams that come from two assets at totally opposite ends of the spectrum. The red bars represent the income that was available had I, for example, retired in 1980 and simply dropped my super payout of $100,000 into a term deposit and rolled it over at maturity each year. As a result, the red bars in this chart 
represent broadly the interest rates that have prevailed in this country over the 30-year period shown. The contrast are the yellow bars, which are the dividends paid had I taken the same amount of money and simply dropped it into a basket of industrial shares represented broadly by the All Industrials Index and simply left it there. Whilst the words left it there for 30 years just roll off my tongue, I acknowledge that it is a big ask as many would be incapable of leaving the investment alone for 30 years. As will be demonstrated in following editions, to achieve the optimal result requires long-term thinking and early planning. In looking at this chart, I want to make you aware that none of the interest or dividends have been reinvested over the 30-year period. I should therefore emphasise that the two income streams you are looking at have been available to all of us over that period and beyond. I would also make the following observation, that many people who have retired over the last four decades that needed the most effective income chose the asset that was the least effective in meeting their goals. The reason was simple. The overriding perception that shares were risky and paid little income whilst term deposits were safe and paid higher income. Let's now examine the concurrent capital performance of these two assets. Not surprisingly, the capital values over the long term reflect the influence of the income streams. Two expressions we should be aware of in relation to companies are dividend payout ratios and retained earnings. What these mean is that most companies do not pay 100% of their profits to shareholders. The dividend payout ratio represents the amount of the profit that a company considers it prudent to pay shareholders each year. The balance of the profit is retained and reinvested in the business. Hence, the vertical yellow bars you see represent approximately 50% of company profits. The balance is reinvested and therefore represented in the yellow line. I hope that it is now becoming apparent why dividends and share prices rise broadly in line with one another as each represents roughly half of the total re return generated by these companies. Cash, in the example above, has a payout ratio of 100%. That is, all of the interest received is spent, not reinvested. Because companies do not normally pay out 100% of earnings in dividends, this does two things. One, it gives a lower initial yield than cash, but Secondly, it gives a bigger asset base for next year's earnings, which should create higher earnings and so on. For the sceptics, even if you reinvested the interest on your cash, it never catches the industrial investment if you had also reinvested dividends. If that all sounds a bit complicated, I would ask you to consider this next chart. I acknowledge it is an oversimplification because it was used at my children's school in an attempt to get this concept across to Year 12 students. Let's say we run a small business with an initial capital of $10,000. And, having modelled the business, we know that at the price we can sell our output, we are able to generate a return on our capital, or ROE, of 10%. Let's also assume a payout ratio of 50%. In year one, we generate a profit of $1,000. We pay a dividend of $500 and retain the balance of the profits of $500. In year two, we now have an expanded capital base, $10,000 plus $500. Therefore, the 10% return on the expanded capital base will now generate a profit of $1,050. Again, we pay half as a dividend, 
and retain the balance. We start year three with a capital base of $11,025. The 10% return produces a return of $1,102 and so on. I hope that this simple example gives you some comfort and, most importantly, an understanding that there is a perfectly rational reason why the value of a good business increases over the long term. I add the caveat that whilst this chart reflects the relatively stable value of a private company with no lunatic shareholders, if we were a public company, our share price could go anywhere, depending on the whim of stockbroking analysts, share traders, hedge funds, etc. I would now like to put all that we have discussed so far into the context of current events. This chart shows the changes in dividends paid by industrial companies over the last 50 odd years. It should be noted that dividends by and large continue to show regular increases, which underpins the future and growth of these companies and our economy. However, there are two bits of this chart that may cause concern for some. The sharp cuts in dividends in 1991 and 2009. Let's look at those two reductions in the context of my earlier chart. The actual reductions in 91 and 2009 are clearly demonstrated. However, let's dig a little deeper. Prior to the reduction in 1991, you will note three quite unusually large increases in dividends. These were a direct result of major changes to the taxation structures at that time. In June 1987, Paul Keating, the then Treasurer, introduced dividend imputation, which removed the iniquitous double taxation of dividends that had prevailed previously. In the two years following the introduction of dividend imputation, he reduced corporate tax rates. These two changes resulted in many companies paying three dividends instead of the normal two. I would therefore argue that although the previous chart shows a substantial drop in dividends of almost 30%, it was no more than a normalisation in response to the major changes previously. I would also like to draw your attention to the years preceding the reduction in 91. The chart shows 16, yes, 16 years of unbroken double digit dividend growth. So as scary as the drop in dividends appears in 91, please consider it in the context of events at that time. Let's now look critically at the reduction in 2009. Similar to the situation in 1991, in the years preceding 2009, we had, I believe, a number of events that led to this reduction. During the irrational exuberance of the period prior, some companies had lifted their payout ratios to levels that would become unsustainable. Secondly, some corporates were not making sufficient profits to pay these substantial dividends and then borrowed to fund these payments, an unsustainable practice. The straw that broke the camel's back were the large number of capital raisings that occurred during the global financial crisis. Companies desperate to repair balance sheets raised billions of dollars in fresh capital through rights issues and share purchase plans. It therefore did not make sense having just raised the capital to immediately pay it back to shareholders as a dividend. All these factors led to a rational reduction of dividends to a more sustainable level for the future, or should I say, going forward. To cap off this session, I would ask you to look again at this chart where I have simply drawn a trend line through the dividends from 1980 to 2009. I believe it displays more than adequately the abnormal above-trend periods for the dividends 
over that 30-year period. I would now like to address what I consider one of the most potentially financially damaging aspects of people's perceptions. I refer to this as the yield trap. It is a clear indication to me of groupthink at its worst. The unquestioning assumption that because everyone is saying the same thing, that it must be right. Let's begin at the start. Yield is a simple mathematical calculation. You divide income by the value of an asset, multiply by 100 over 1, and pay presto, it is in this simple calculation that the trap lies. When I calculate the yield, you will note that I take two absolute dollar values, and by dividing them into one another, I convert them to an abstract number. That is, they are no longer dollar values, also, note that the percentage sign in maths simply denotes a ratio. And can I stress again an abstract number? Let's now look at this chart again. I have the two number series in here, values and income. So, it is a simple exercise to do the maths. Calculate the yield each year and plot it on a chart to enable us to consider the yield on these two investments over time. Before we do this, I would ask that you consider your response to this question. Which income stream would you like to struggle by on for the rest of your life, yellow or red? Let's now look at the yield graph. Based on yield alone, which investment would you prefer? Before making your decision, let me alert you to the fact that the yield on term deposits in the recent past has been artificially low as central banks around the world have steadily cut interest rates to try and protect us from our overwhelmingly speculative behaviour over the last four decades. 1994 was the year of the global financial market meltdown, 2002 was the dot-com bust, 2009 the global financial crisis, and so on. For the sake of the example, I ask you to consider the period, late 80s and early 90s. If I had offered you a 15% yield on a term deposit, or a 5% yield on shares, which would have been the lay-down Mazaire decision? Consider now your decision based on the previous chart, the red or yellow bars. When offered the dollar value income streams in the previous chart, most investors would choose the yellow or dividend income for the long term. If, however, you are offered the yield alternative, most would choose the term deposit option. Let's look again at the chart. The yield trap occurs because calculating the abstract called yield ignores the fact that shares provide a growing income stream and a growing asset value over the long term. If you divide the steadily rising dividends each year by the value of share prices that are also rising, it is clearly apparent that you will generate an abstract yield for shares that is relatively constant around 4-5% on average. In looking at this chart, it is important to understand that although the yield on shares in 1980 was just over 5%, and that the yield on shares in 2009 is only 4.6%, you must acknowledge that whilst 5% of 100,000 was attractive at the time, isn't 4.6% of $1.3 million today a touch more attractive? It is time to get on the escalator. Before I leave this concept behind, I would like to make two points. Firstly, all yield tells you is numerically where the value line is relative to the top of the income bar. So if dividends remain stable and share prices fall, it is clear that yields would rise as the denominator decreases. Conversely, if share prices rise, then yields would fall. Secondly, as a rough rule of thumb, the higher the initial yield you choose, the worse your income will get. The lower 
within reason, yield that you choose, the better your income will get. We have so far examined two of the three primary assets. Let us now examine the third, property. Time precludes me from addressing residential, so I will restrict the majority of my remarks to the commercial property sector as represented by the listed property trusts. It has interested me that when I have asked audiences which was the better investment, property or shares, a large number of people believe property to be the superior investment. I find this attitude interesting from a purely academic point of view, as it begs the question, if you could make more money owning property than running a business, why would anyone run a business? As an initial reference point, I want to revisit the cash and shares example. For comparison purposes, I'm going to strip the term deposit out of this chart and replace it with the listed property trust index in exactly the same format, with capital and income separated. Hopefully, this puts pay to any misconceptions people may have about the relative merits of shares versus property. If the mauve bars and line exceeded the yellow, there would be a clear case for all businesses to shut down and simply speculate in property along with us. Surely we must acknowledge that businesses create the wealth that enables them and us to own property. If this were not the case and property was better than shares, then surely the banks wouldn't lend us money to buy property but would buy it for themselves, for shareholders. Obviously Mervac, Stockland etc would build houses and apartments and keep them rather than sell them to you and I to make our fortunes. The extraordinary lack of critical assessment of property remains a source of amazement to me. However, back to the chart. This is the best example I can imagine of the yield trap. Over the years, I was made very aware of the love affairs retirees had with listed property trusts. They were high yielding and thus attractive for those seeking income and were also, quote, property and thus added an additional layer of emotional comfort. Hopefully, recent events will have disabused people of that notion but I suspect old habits die hard. Let me repeat an earlier question. Which income stream would you like to struggle by on for the rest of your life? Let's now apply the yield calculation and plot them as we did earlier with cash and shares. Based on yield alone, which investment would you have preferred? Here is the yield trap in all its glory. Choosing your source of income based on the yield available has always been fraught with danger. Let's now go back to the original chart and explore why this picture looks as it does. I want to remind you of some of my earlier comments. The reason the yield on listed property trusts is high is simply a function of the fact that the capital value, the MOVE line, is well below the top of the income bar. Conversely with shares, the yield is low because the capital value is almost level with the top of the income bar. What makes the whole equation even more tragic for those sucked in by the high yields on offer is the fact that listed property trusts have a 100% payout ratio. They have no retained earnings and the vertical mauve bars represent 100% of the income generated. The yellow bars, as I indicated earlier, represent only around 50% of company profits. As a final coup de grace, I would alert you to the fact that the All Industrials Index, represented by the yellow line, includes the Listed Property Trust Index, i.e. it's an integral part of the Industrials Index you see here. If therefore, as an investor, I choose industrial shares and no listed property trusts. I want you to imagine what happens to the yellow line if you take the mauve line out of it. This is why industry is far better served getting rid of the property of its balance sheets 
and investing the money back into their businesses. This is why Mervac and Stockland will never own what they build, but continue to sell it to property speculators. The old expression, information isn't knowledge and knowledge isn't wisdom, springs to mind when thinking about investing. Too often people assume that that vast amount of information will somehow give them an advantage. My perception has always been, as I mentioned earlier, that knowledge is required to assimilate and use information productively. Without the knowledge, information is largely useless chatter. With that in mind, I would like to finish with some observations on attitudes that have prevailed, certainly during my career. In all the earlier sessions, I separated income and capital to give you what I hope is an indelible impression of the two-dimensional nature of assets, income and capital. In this chart, I have simply reinvested the interest from term deposits, the income from listed property trusts and dividends from industrial shares. The first observation I would make is how comprehensively people are upset by the market corrections. In over 40 years in this industry and having worked for fund managers here and abroad, I am acutely aware of this. Whenever a major setback occurs, the customer service lines at the fund managers' call centres start lighting up like Christmas trees, as more and more people ring to complain that we had lost their money. Why did they never ring when we were making it for them? I know why. That was down to them, and they were feeling good. The disasters were always going to be ours. The other recurrent event was more frequent and would often occur at presentations I was giving. For example, when I present now, at question time, I'm often confronted with a question along the following lines. Look, it's all well and good what you've said about shares, but with the global financial crisis and a possible double dip, the Gulf War, and with interest rates on the rise, I feel very nervous about investing at present. The last three years has seen this message delivered to me on many occasions. Let's indulge in an exercise in mental gymnastics. I want you to come back in time with me and you must forget all that you know between now and the date I take you back to. Here we are in December 2002. The dot-com bust is in full swing and markets around the world are headed south. Central banks around the world are slashing interest rates to try and protect us from our earlier stupidity. The question pops up. Excuse me, it's all well and good, your comments about shares, but with the share market falling out of bed, I feel very nervous about investing at present, especially with all the other problems we're facing. Here we are now in December 2001. The dot-com boom is in full swing and markets are headed for the stars. Up goes a hand. Excuse me, your comments about shares are all well and good, but with the share market at an all-time high, I feel nervous investing when it's so high, especially with the global problems we're facing. Around December 2000, the comments were the same. A nervousness about the fact that the market was at an all-time high and a nagging concern about global problems. Here we are again, December 1999. Excuse me, it's all well and good what you've said about shares, but with the market at an all-time high, I feel nervous about investing when it's so high, especially with all the problems at present. Perception is reality. All I've ever had is people telling me they are nervous because it is rising. They are frightened because it's falling, because it is rising, falling, rising. For 40 years, this is all I have ever had jammed in my face. The reason these issues are raised again and again is quite simple. Everybody I know reads this chart from the right to the left. There is one fundamental difference between me and the rest of the world. I read this chart from the left to the right, and I will defy anyone to tell me that what I'm about to point out is wrong. If I start in 1980, the share market at that time was an all-time low. In 1981, it was also at a low and again every year until 1987, when it was even lower, 
and so on, all the way up to December 2009, at which point it remained at an all-time low compared to the future. My question is, which way are most people investing, backwards or forwards? I perceive that most people spend much of their lives looking backwards with regret, incapable of creating their financial futures. I believe we owe it to our children to encourage them to face their futures, not our pasts.